And then I think after that, I'll start sharing with you the insight that we shared with you about
something or sense something or knew something that I, that, that I could sense was the truth, I noticed that my brain would go like, nope, don't listen to that, that's a bunch of nonsense, we're not going to do that. Especially in moments when I was supposed to speak the truth to someone that I cared about, or find the courage to speak the truth to someone to give them some insight. My brain would always talk and, and cast out and go, what if it doesn't work out? What if they don't agree with you? What if they don't recognize you? What if they don't accept you? It's going to cause, came up with all these reasons to doubt the communication that was coming from here. And I said, that's kind of weird. It's like two different worlds in society. So then I looked at my life because I wanted to make a difference. And I was willing to make the effort. If God really existed, if there was a higher wisdom out there and it really existed, I was ready to do my part because I didn't like the outcome of my choices so far. So I started looking at, I started looking at, can I have more moments where I just know the truth about things? Is that possible? Because when I did sense something or feel something, it's almost like they were like six months apart, maybe three months apart, and you know, it was only one, but can I do it every day? Is there a way or a process that I can dedicate myself to where I can have more moments where I just know the truth? And is it really the truth that I don't feel or sense it? So the only thing I knew how to do was to learn how to quiet my brain. I said, if that's not a source of divine truth, if that's not really telling me some higher good or giving me a, giving me a, a universal direction or some kind of guidance of, that's based on love, if that's not really doing it, then the only thing I know is maybe I'm not going to listen to it anymore. So I went off this little journey to see if I can quiet my thinking. Man, that was wrong. I, I, I must have lasted for about three seconds, you know, so I'm going to go, how do you quiet your thinking? How do you do all that, right? How do you quiet? You know, people refer to it as your mind, and your mental thinking and your mind is two different things. But how do you quiet your, how do you quiet your mental thinking? And how do you do that? So again, I was looking at it where I was a student of all this. If there was a process to learn, then I was going to learn it. And it wasn't doing it for anyone else except for me. So I would look at, so I did it for like three seconds, and then I went back to it. I did it for five seconds, and I went back to it. I did it for three seconds. I didn't want to go backwards, I wanted to go forwards. And then slowly I started doing it just a little bit longer, maybe six seconds, maybe 10 seconds. And I realized what I would do is at the end of the day when I was working on doing this and not knowing whether or not it was going to provide a successful outcome or the outcome that I was looking for, I would just go and contemplate everything that I was experiencing. I'd go and pay attention to when I did quiet my mind, when I did quiet my thinking, what was happening to me at that moment? And when my mind wasn't quiet, what was happening to me at the moment? And so as I started doing it longer and longer, it was almost like blind faith. I had no idea whether this was the right direction or not the right direction, but this is the direction I was going into. And it was right around when I could start doing it for like an hour. That in that time, when, about, um, when I could hold on to it for like about an hour, knowledge started coming to me or insight about the process I was, I was going through. So let's go and let's go and do something just for a minute. I'm going to ask all of you. I'm going to ask all of you to put yourself in a state of peace. You don't have to close your eyes. You can close your eyes. But I'm going to ask you because this is the process that I went through. Put yourself in a state of peace. However you do it. <clears throat> Just for a second, put yourself in a state of peace. And once you get into that state of peace, can you put yourself into a deeper state of peace? Do you have the ability of doing it? And one more thing, can you put yourself into an even deeper state of peace? Okay, I'm going to ask you to stop. So when I start... Hey, no, I couldn't do it at all. <laughs> yes. And so I wasn't trying to put myself in a state of peace. I was just quieting my mind. But that's one of the things I noticed. Anytime I did quiet my brain, a peaceful state came over me. And when I started looking at the process, I said to myself this question. What part of me was capable of quieting my brain? What part of me was capable of quieting my thinking, even if it was only for three seconds or five seconds in the beginning? There was some part of me that was doing it. And so again, I just studied the process. The other part of the pro the other thing that came to me was I was in a state of peace like you guys were. 
And I was like, that's different. Like, I've been looking for peace my whole life. And it makes sense, too, if my brain was quiet, a state of peace came over me. And I said, well, who gave me that? Where did that come from? And is that true about everyone? If we all quiet, if we all put ourselves in a state of peace, and we're all capable of doing that, if how we do it, if everybody says the same thing, has the same answer on how we do it, is not, not universal. And if it's universal, isn't that proof that there's a universal God that maybe created all this? So let me ask you this. What did you do to yourself in order to achieve a state of peace? And what did the breathing help you do? Just let out the tension. So you let out the tension, you saw the white light, it calmed yourself. Would you say this? Did you, in order to achieve a peaceful state, like I asked you to, did you quiet your thinking? Or did you or did you think more? Did you think twice as much in order to get to that state of peace? Or did you quiet your thinking? How many people increased their thinking? How many people started thinking twice as much in order to put in a state of peace? Nobody, right? So it's kind of universal, right? So in order to get us ourselves in a state of peace, even if it's for three seconds, one of the requirements is that we have to quiet our thinking. And then that's what I came to the conclusion too, like what part of me was able to do? So now I came to this, I got the state of peace, and I said that was kind of cool, but what part of me? What part of you think? What part of you would you say quieted your thinking? Was it your brain or was it your body? Was it your brain quieting its own self? Because you asked your brain to quiet itself, so it did. And then other times you don't ask your brain to quiet yourself. But aren't we asking our brain to quiet ourselves for a long period of time, but the brain's not doing it, if that's true? Or is there another part of you that had the ability of quieting your, your thinking in order to achieve a state of peace? What do you guys do? So that's how I look at it. I looked at it like my spirit was quieting my brain. It was compelling my brain to quiet, but it can only do it for a short period of time. Why? If my spirit was so great. If my spirit was so great, if there was really a God, and there was a universal way of life that was based on the power of communication of unconditional love, the way I was following this and pursuing all this, why can my spirit only be quieting my brain for three seconds or four seconds at first? How come my spirit's not stronger? And so I started looking at my life, and I said, what if it has to do with strength? What if in our body, what if in, inside of us, would you say there's three parts? Would you say there's a brain, a body, and a spirit? Would that be true? Would you guys agree to that? Do you guys feel like you have a spirit? What if our brain has a mental strength? And what if our body has a physical strength? And if I work out and I... I work out my body, my strength can increase. If I use my brain for different to for in different kind of ways, I can increase my thinking power. I can increase the way I think, and the power of that. What's the strength of my spirit? What if it's our will? What if it's the will of our spirit? What everybody talks about, if it's the will of our spirit. And what if I haven't listened to my spirit for 44 years, because that's the age I was at for all this. I was 44 years old when I started all this. And what if at that age, for 44 years in life, I've been building my mental strength, but not my spiritual strength? What if the will of my spirit was just that weak and was showing me that? That my brain was much stronger because I'd been building up on it. And it made sense to me because when I was growing up, when I came into this world, we all, all of us, wouldn't we say that babies or the spirits and babies are very pure, or very innocent, or the spirit inside of all of us? When we were young, right? When we're just coming into this world. Nobody's taught us anything. Nobody's influenced, I should say, us yet. So we're very, very pure. And we might say that the way that we talk to children when they're young, we go down to a level where we pass on our voice in a soft, caring, loving way. And babies kind of respond to that level. But if we yell at a child, the child already knows that I don't like this kind of attention. Why not? Why don't we, why don't we, why don't we smile when somebody yells at us? Why do we smile when somebody's being more loving to us? Who wrote that? Who did all that? So now your children get older, and all of a sudden, as you get older, your parents start to say, think about this, and think about that, and think about this, and think about that. Nobody teaches us about our spirit. Nobody tell. we don't have to sit down with our family and talk about the will of our spirit, but we don't talk about the communication of love, even though it's so big inside of all of us, and it's all universal. 
We never talk about it. We talk about thinking about thinking about it. So now we're teaching ourselves at a young age to make yourself brain center. Now you go into school. You're four years old. You're five years old. Your teachers, for eight hours a day, go, think about this, think about that. Use your brain to remember. Nobody talks about your spirit. Nobody talks about love or the unconditional love and the power of it all. We talk about brain. So it makes sense to me that if I was taught to be brain-centered, I was brain-centered. I was brain-dominant. And my interpretation of life was all through my thinking. It was all through the way my brain interpreted life. And then I would see shows sometimes, and then we'd go like, watch how easy it is to fool your brain. Look at this picture, and this picture, and this picture, and you're going to see this even though it doesn't exist. Or do this, and do this, and this, and this doesn't exist. And I was like, well, if my brain can be fooled, how is that a source of guidance for my life? What if it's fooled about what it should, what it's guiding me to do? What if it doesn't know the truth? That would make sense to me because my life proved it. I was in a low ground. So, it made sense to me that if I quieted my brain and I started to get a sense of peace, and it was my spirit that did it, that the more often I did this, the stronger my spirit would go because I'm showing faith in my spirit for the first time. And that's what happened. I did it for an hour, did it for an hour and a half, two hours. But then I started getting insight about the whole process. I realized it was my faith. I realized that whatever I put my faith in, it grows. If I put my faith in a mental, a mentally centered existence, that grows. If I put my faith in some a book, if I put my faith in a person, that's going to help it grow. It's going to show support. If I put my faith in my spirit, which I haven't done yet, this was making sense because for the first time I was putting my faith in the right direction. And I had this power. I had the ability of putting faith in something and making it grow. It was up to me, not anyone else. I realized this was an independent journey. I realized that I could call somebody up and somebody could bring food over to my house for me to eat. Somebody, I didn't have to pick it out of the ground. I didn't have to plant it. I didn't have to do anything. Don't bring it to my house for me to eat. I realized it's the same thing if I, if I wanted something to drink. Somebody's going to make the whole process and then bring it to me. Or I can go to a store and just pick it up. If I needed transportation, I didn't have to build my own car. Somebody made it for me. I just have to go pick it up. Same thing with a hat, same thing with my clothes, same thing with my fur. I didn't have to do a thing, but not my spirit. I realized nobody could do this for me. There was no divine intervention that was coming down. It was about me having faith in myself. So now I started seeing proof. I started seeing some validation. A state of peace came over me. I started being inspired with knowledge to explain the process. I started being led in a direction for the first time where by myself I was going towards my spirit. I was going towards faith. I was going towards the process of putting my spirit first. And what I learned is that when I put my spirit at the forefront of my life, my spirit has abilities that my brain does. So now what happened was that when every time I put my spirit first, my brain was second. And when it was second, when it was back here, it wasn't thinking. And then I realized that as I started doing all this, as I started doing it more, I had started having more moments where I just knew the truth about it. For the first time in my life, I was being more spiritually centered. Through my faith, my trust, and my self-courage, in a different way to approach life and to interpret life, I took the thing that wasn't working for me, I put it second, and the thing that I didn't give it a chance yet, and I put that first. Nobody else did it but me. I realized I had this power. And as I started doing it, as I started putting my spirit at the forefront of my life, the abilities of my spirit started shining. I started being able to sense energy. I started picking up on information. I started knowing things about life. But it wasn't something that could benefit me where I go, hey, I can pick the numbers of the lottery today. It was about the growth of my spirit. It's about the evolution of my spirit. And so the first thing I got connected to was a higher wisdom. And I didn't understand it at the time, but I do now. It's because I got connected to what I had the greatest spiritual need for. And that was a different insight. That was a different guidance in life. So what I had a strong spiritual need for, I got connected to it. And I thought I was crazy. I thought I was nuts. I would sit on my couch that we borrowed. I had no money. I was in debt. And day after day, for a year and a half, I'd listen. 
Because I looked at it this way, if there really is a God, then maybe I should give that God respect. If there really is a higher wisdom, then maybe I should give it its due respect. Maybe I should show a faith, like I have been so far, but to a greater degree, and maybe I can have even more moments where I get inspired with knowledge. And that's what I did every single day. I would go to work, I would come home, I would see my daughter, I would come home and I would spend time listening. And I wouldn't take no for an answer. I compelled myself by putting faith in my spirit to compel my brain to be quiet, and I kept it there. And I started building on that spiritual strength, that became a spiritual center. And when you get connected to what you spiritually need in life, you receive knowledge. And I paid attention to how the knowledge was. And I said, you know, it's much different than the way the knowledge comes in my head. When I get knowledge through my spirit, because I didn't know the difference, how do you know the difference between your thinking and you get knowledge through your spirit, if this was all true? And when you get knowledge through your spirit, it's based on inspiration. You get inspired. You get inspired with knowledge that when you, when you receive this knowledge, you go, that didn't come from me. So I started paying attention to moments where even the little whisper of knowledge, the little whisper of any kind of insight, I started putting more focus and personal attention and more awareness on it than I ever had before. If that knowledge didn't come from me, and there's really a God that exists or a higher wisdom, then can I grow that amount of wisdom coming inside me? So it was based on inspiration. And I said, you know, that makes sense. But what is inspiration? What does that mean when you're inspired with knowledge? Because that's what it felt like to me, and that's what it was. It was the knowledge came from an outside source. And the inspirational knowledge only seemed to benefit my life. It was like these tiny wisps of, of words or feelings or senses that always seemed to kind of benefit my life. And inside of this way, when I started paying attention to it, and I, I said, you know, it's, it's inspiration. It made sense to me that I'm inspired about knowledge, but I still got to choose on whether or not I wanted to accept it or not. I said, you know, that makes sense, because that, that's in alignment with what we call free will. If, I'm, if there really is a loving existence, if there's a loving God out there, if there's a universal existence, if it created all of this, then I should be seeing this proof that I'm inspired with knowledge, but I still have the freedom on whether to accept it. It wasn't like when I grew up in life and people were yelling at me, going, you've got to do this, and you've got to do that, and the fingers would be pointing and you know, pushed in a direction. There was no force. And here's the first time that I started getting a foundation on how the communication of love works. I started realizing again that this inspiration, this knowledge that was coming to me, I put myself in a position through faith and courage to have more moments of this, and then all of a sudden, this knowledge that was this knowledge was coming to me gave me the choice of whether I wanted to follow it or not. So I said, okay, that's how love works. But maybe there's a difference between love and unconditional love. Maybe it's two different things, and I'll talk about that later on. So now I'm starting to form not only a process of how this all works. I realize my my spirit is compelling my brain through faith, to quiet itself. And the stronger my spirit comes, the longer I'm seeing the result is that I can do this. To up to an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, three hours. So then I started learning about knowledge, how it's based on inspiration. I also realized that it was the first thing that came to me, meaning that my brain was trying to talk me out of the knowledge that I already received. So if I got it first, it shows me that the spiritual knowledge, the inspiration that we get, there's something about it's quicker than how my head thinks, my brain thinks. I said, that makes sense to me about maybe there's a state of oneness that we're in. Maybe I'm tapping into it somehow. Maybe for the first time in my life, I'm able to create a shift in my own life without anybody's help, just by my own faith in, 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 um, in the existence of my spirit. For the very first time, I'm transforming myself. And I had this power all along, but nobody ever just shared it with me. And it was all up to me, nobody else. Nobody could help me with it. There was no divine intervention. There was no touching on the head and go, everything is fine now. You can do this. There was no gift. You have a gift, everybody has a gift. What if our gift is our spirit? What if our gift is the abilities of our spirit? And what if nobody just taught us when we were growing up 
how to grow these abilities. What if it was just something like that? And it was universal to all people. So as I started getting connected to what I consider to be a higher wisdom, I started just receiving knowledge. And everything started forming about a foundation of a way of life that's based on the communication of unconditional love. Now more than ever in my life, I can explain every aspect of our life, your life, my life, anybody's life. It all comes down to the communication of unconditional love. Everything. And I can never do that. The most important thing to me at the time was seeing proof. Because I just didn't want to go and say, hey, my life has changed, but it really hasn't. I didn't want to create a false image for myself. I didn't want to believe in something that wasn't based on the truth. So I said, if God really exists, if there really is some kind of divine existence or intelligence, I'm not asking too much to see proof of that intelligence in my own life. And I'll make the effort. So inside of that way, as I started getting information, forming a way of life that's based on the communication of unconditional love, I noticed three things about myself. I noticed the pace of my life changed. I slowed down. I noticed that when I was thinking all the time, my brain was always going at this top speed, going here, 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 here. Think about this, think about that, think about this. And all of a sudden, bam. It was almost like I always stayed in the moment. It was almost like my life was one big moment, and it's still to that way to this day. There is no forward or back, it's one big moment. And in this moment, my main purpose is to stay connected to the higher wisdom, everything else comes second. And can I live my life that way? Can I stay connected to this higher wisdom? Can I drive a car? Can I go to my job as an undercover narcotics detective? Can I, can, I make, can, I, can I have relationships? Can I interact with people in a better way than I could before? And so, the, so that, was, that was the first thing. This is me being inspired. <laughs> and so inside of this way, so when I started, because I lost where I was supposed to go with this, inside of this way, as I'm starting to learn more, I'm starting to, can I function in life that way? So again, it's all based on blind faith. Everything is based on blind faith. As I started getting connected to a higher source of wisdom, I wanted to see proof of it all. So what I did was, I invited my close friends after doing this for about a year, a year and a half, people that I thought would understand, there was like four or five of them. I got them together, I didn't tell them what I wanted to do, and I said, I want you to debate me. I'm gonna share some knowledge with you. And I said things should be universal. I don't want you to agree with me, I want you to disagree with me, I want you to fight as much as you possibly can to find flaws in what I'm saying. I'm asking you to do that. So I talked for like two and a half hours, three hours, and I shared information. And in the end, I said, please debate me or even in between. I noticed, this was really cool, I noticed that when I was talking, a blank look would come over their face. And I said, I said, I bet I did the same exact way when I shut my brain down. It's almost like staring off. Do you ever find yourself staring off? You're actually shutting your brain down 